In this video, we will discuss Gibbs free energy, which is delta G. And in the thermodynamics unit, this is by far the most important set of notes because everything after this set of notes and even before it is based on delta G. Now, we have done a couple delta G equations before from your formula sheet. We've done delta G equals minus RT ln K, and we've done delta G equals minus NFE. And remember the little not signs that I'm pointing to right here. Those are all at standard conditions, which would be 298 Kelvin. But this same formula uh, is true if we get rid of those knots, okay? Um, the only thing that would be different is that the temperature would not be 298 Kelvin. Now, remember, delta G measures the total energy gained or lost in a system. And we've got energy built up in heat, and we've got energy built up in entropy um, in how things are ordered. So what I want to do is I want to make sure I understand this equation really, really well, because we're going to use it a whole bunch, and it's going to show up on the AP test many, many times. So delta G is typically in joules per mole. Sometimes you'll see it in kilojoules per mole, but I would stick to just getting it into joules. Temperature is always in Kelvin, and entropy is in units of joules divided by moles Kelvin. Okay, so right now we've got joules and joules, so that adds up. But for whatever reason, um, enthalpy, or delta H, is almost always given in kilojoules per mole. And so this formula will not work unless everything is in the same joules unit. So what I want you to make a note of in star, highlight, whatever you need to do, is the first thing you're going to need to do on any delta G problem that uses this specific formula is you need to convert to joules per mole, okay? I cannot emphasize that enough. Okay. So, looking at, uh, this is called the Gibbs-Hemholtz equation. This delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, and so I'm going to write that here because we're going to study this reaction. Oops. And let's look at case A. I'm going to say that the entropy and the enthalpy are both, both positive. So what I want to know is I want to know when is delta G negative and when is it positive? Remember, a negative delta G equals a spontaneous process, although the AP test will not use that word. It will use the words thermodynamically favorable. And uh, positive delta G is non-spawn or not spontaneous or not thermodynamically favorable. So what I know is that if... Delta H is positive. If I want delta G to be negative, to be spontaneous, so let's say delta G is negative, then what that means is I need to subtract a large value here with what I've underlined here with this U. Well, the delta S is... Um, what it is. So what that means is I need the temperature to be a very large value. Okay, so delta G could be negative, and it would be negative um, if T delta S, let me say it like this, if T delta S is a large value. AKA at high temperatures. Now, I don't know how high the temperature would need to go. I need I would need to plug in specific numbers, but the higher the temperature, the more spontaneous it would go. Now, on the flip side, what if this temperature value was not very high? What if it wasn't high enough to have this U value, this T delta S value, to... Um, 
turn delta G negative. Well, then that means delta G could be positive, and that would be true if T delta S is a small number or a small value. And that would be true at low temperatures. Okay, now up here it says exothermic processes and increasing disorder is what favors a reaction to occur. I think of outer space when I think of what is needed for a spontaneous process or what makes uh, heat and disorder spontaneous. So outer space is cold and disordered. Okay, and since outer space is cold and disordered, what that means is that um, exothermic and positive delta S is what drives a process. Here, all we have is a positive delta S, so we would say that um, entropy drives this reaction. Okay, now looking at another situation, we have a positive delta H and a negative delta S. So the formula is delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. If delta H is positive. This T delta S, this minus T delta S will also be positive because delta S is negative. So what that means is I could never get delta G to be negative here mathematically. So delta G is always positive. So the answer as to what drives a reaction, well, we're always non-spontaneous. We're gaining heat and losing disorder. That's Neither of those are favorable. So neither entropy or enthalpy drive this reaction. Now, let's take this same formula and see what happens when our signs are a little bit different. Let's say delta H is negative and delta S is positive. Well, a negative minus this value with, actually I should put it with the negative. This will always be negative, so a negative minus a negative is still a negative. And so this delta G, if this is a situation, is always negative. And so that means it's always spontaneous. It doesn't matter what the temperature is. Uh, both delta H and delta S drive this reaction, both enthalpy and entropy. Now, what if we have a negative delta H and a negative delta S? Delta S is negative, delta H is negative. Then that means that this value this T delta S value is positive. Well, if I have a really large delta H value and T delta S is not that large, then that means I'll stay negative. But if delta H is not a large value, but T delta S is a large value, then I'll have a positive number. So what we can say, and I'm gonna erase this to make room, is that, well, it kind of depends. Delta G could be negative or delta G could be positive, and we've got to think about the math behind it. If delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, and this is negative, and then this is positive, this T delta S value, this minus T delta S will actually be added, um, then in order to have a spontaneous or negative delta G, T delta S needs to be small. AKA low temperature. So my T value doesn't drive up that value. And um, if delta G were to be positive, then T delta S needs to be large, which is AKA at a high temperature. Okay, so what drives this process? Is it favorable to lose heat? Yes, so I know enthalpy drives this process. Is it favorable to lose disorder? No, so I know entropy does not. 
Now, I've just walked through all the math here, and I, I probably went a little bit faster than what I would have liked, but I'm going to show you a cheat sheet, okay? And so I would know this because you don't want to be thinking through the math on a timed test when you don't have to. That you need to know that gaining, and I can't spell, gaining disorder which is a positive delta s and losing heat is spontaneous okay and so then therefore the opposite would be non-spontaneous that's not too bad but it's if i have negative delta h and negative delta s and i want to compare that to positive delta h and positive delta s i can think of that if they're both negative they will be spawn at low temps so i like to say negative negative low negative negative low okay so if both of them are negative will be spontaneous at low temps on the flip side, if they're both positive, they will be spawn at high temps. Okay, so positive, positive, high, positive, positive, high. That's how I like to think about it. For whatever reason, it kind of makes sense to me that if they're both negative, then low is what it should be paired to. And if they're both positive, then high is what they should be paired to as far as the temperature requirement um, for when they should be spontaneous. Now again, I don't know what that temperature is. We would have to have numbers and do the math to know exactly, okay? But what this leads to is I can look at a reaction, a whole bunch of processes. We'll look at just a couple here. And I can, um, I can, and I'm gonna erase this. I want this to not be letter from the chart. I want it to say delta Oops, I want this to say delta S equals positive or negative, and then delta H equals positive or negative. So heat is on this side. We are gaining heat, so delta H equals positive. And then we're going from solid to aqueous, aqueous. So delta S is going to be positive as well. So I can think about the numbers, or I can think about, okay, when is this going to be thermodynamically favored? which that just means spontaneous. Well, they're both positive, so I can remember positive, positive, high temps. So this will only be uh, spontaneous at high temperatures. And again, we need numbers to figure out what that high temperature would be. And what drives this reaction? Well, it's gonna be entropy. Okay, it is favorable to gain disorder, but it is not favorable to gain heat. So then on the second one, we're going from aqueous, aqueous to aqueous liquid. Aqueous is a little bit more disordered than liquid. And so actually I lose disorder. Delta S is actually negative here. But heat is on the product side. So that means I'm also losing heat. So they're both negative. So negative, negative, low temps. So I know that this is spontaneous only at low temps. And it's favorable to lose heat, so I know enthalpy is what uh, is driving this reaction. If I look at this fourth one with HCl and copper, heat is on the product side, so delta H is negative. And then I'm going from aqueous and solid to aqueous and gas. Uh, gases are way more entropy than um, solid, so I know I'm gaining disorder. Gases are kind of a little bit hectic with how they behave, and so they're very disordered. So now they're not the same, so I don't have a nice little phrase like negative, negative, low, and positive, positive, high to work with. But I can think about it as delta H. Is it, po is it spontaneous or favorable to lose heat? Yes. So I know enthalpy is driving this reaction. And then I can think, is it favorable to gain disorder? Yes. So this is both enthalpy and entropy. 
And so this is spontaneous at all temps. Okay, or always, however you want to think about it. Okay, and then we're going to do one example with some math. That way you can see how this works. Is I've got a certain chemical reaction, and I'm not actually given the chemical reaction, but I'm given delta H and uh, delta S. And there's a uh, reaction. We are having a negative delta H, so we are losing heat. So this is exothermic, and that's because delta H is negative. And then do we get an increase or decrease in the randomness? Or we can think of this as disorder, however you want to think about it. Um, well, delta S is negative, so we actually lose disorder. And that's because delta S is negative as well. So when is this reaction spontaneous? I know at low temps, okay? I know it's spontaneous at low temps because they're both negative, 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 low. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to see, I'm going to use the math to tell me, is it going to be spontaneous at 298 Kelvin? Because for some reactions, 298 Kelvin is a low temperature, but for others, it's not, okay? We just got to see what our numbers tell us. So delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. And um, delta G is what we're solving for. And when we solve for delta G, we need to remember that we're going to solve for it in joules per mole. Um, delta H is not 35.4, negative 35.4, but negative 35,400 uh, or 35,400 joules per mole because we need it to be in joules minus the temperature, which is 298 Kelvin times delta S, and remember delta S already has joules, so we're good, minus 85.5 joules divided by moles times Kelvin. And when I get my delta G, delta Gs are typically uh, large numbers, I get negative 9.92 times 10 to the third. And so that's my delta G. It maths out to be in joules per mole. Um, I would always solve for your delta G for joules per mole. Sometimes Rarely, but sometimes I have seen it. The AP test will have you solve for it in kilojoules, but that's not what we're worried about um, because most of the time it'll be in joules per mole. And then the last question, it says, is it spontaneous or thermodynamically favorable? Yes, and all your reasoning needs to be is because delta G is negative. Okay, It's favorable to lose energy.